a new model for industrial innovation. That's kind of a cheeky claim for a young organization. and It begs the question, what's wrong with the old model? And what are you going to do about it? The first part is maybe self-evident. The, the things that we cling to as the great technological contributions over the last century have mostly come from large-scale corporate research and development. And yet, in spite of that, we've spent the better part of the last 30 years dismantling the engine of our prosperity. It's understandable. It comes from the pressures of international competition, new Wall Street expectations, new business models that focus on cost-cutting, downsizing, and outsourcing. But it's left our industries vulnerable. Why? Because we're going through a century shift in the underlying technology for most of those anchor industries. So as the disruptive technologies come through, they're left ill-prepared internally to cope with those changes. And so the question is, if we're going to invent a new model to replace that, what can we learn from the past? And if we talk about innovation and creativity, let's start with what we learn in school. The source of creativity that we're taught is to intuit from the great works of man in literature, in the fine arts and the performing arts. Well, how does that sound? To be or not to be? Oi, that's the rub. No, no. To be or not to be? That is the question. Ach, nein, nein. What are you going to do? What about a Mona Lisa's bloodshot eyes? Hmm. It's a solitary act. Right? It all happens in the mind of the artist, from the conception to the execution. And so that's what we're taught to believe is the way creativity takes place. And if we look back at that era before the great corporate R&D, we might be led to believe the same thing. All of those great names right, that we associate, not only with great inventions, but with the companies that they launched but they're not here, right? We don't know how they did what they did. There's a little bit of fragments, but they existed in the era before the camera was always on and every thought could be documented. Wouldn't it be nice if we could simply say, hey, Alexa, place a call to Alexander Graham Bell. I'm placing a TED time call to Alexander Graham Bell. Really? Ahoy, ahoy, I say. Alexander Graham Bell here. You know, I once said, the day will come when the man at the telephone will see the distant person to whom he's speaking. But I didn't quite foresee this Alexa lassie. Aye, she wakes the dead. So now you have me. What's your pleasure? Well, Mr. Bell, in our time, we have the idea that the inventors of the 19th century worked alone like artists from idea to finished product. Well, I hardly worked alone. And it took years to make a successful company. Great discoveries and improvements invariably involve the cooperation of many minds. I may be given the credit for having blazed the trail, but when I look at the subsequent developments, I feel the credit is due to others rather than to myself. So others were involved in the invention of the telephone? Hey, laddie boy, I was in a neck and neck race with Mr. Gray to complete our apparatus first. He had the advantage over me in being a practical electrician, but I was better acquainted with the phenomena of sound, which was my advantage. I hired Mr. Watson because of his engineering skills, and I could never have completed the phone without him. And there were others that followed on the basic invention to make it practical as a commercial service. Take that young man there in New Jersey, Thomas Edison. His ticker tape showed how to run multiple signals on a single line, and he invented a carbon microphone that was used in phones for over a hundred years. <laughs> Let me conference him in, and he can explain it himself. You can do that? Hello, Edison here. I invented that too, you know. Bellwood had everyone answering the phone with ahoy. What are we, pirates? The Brits used it to show surprise, like hello. It seemed to me like a practical solution. Simple, easy to understand on the phone. Doesn't sound like any other word. And it's stuck. So Mr. Edison, we regard you as one of the greatest inventors of our time. You had over a thousand patents. 
1,093. Yes, 1,093. How did you come up with so many ideas? I'm more of a sponge than an inventor. I'm a sort of middleman between the long-haired and impractical inventor and the hard-headed businessman who measures all things in terms of dollars and cents. I give commercial value to the brilliant but misdirected ideas of others. And anything that won't sell, I don't want to invent. It's sale is proof of utility, and utility is success. So you've said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. What did you mean by that? An essential for any inventor is a logical mind that sees analogies, and has been just so in all of my inventions. The first step is an intuition, and it comes with a burst. Then difficulties arise. Bugs show themselves, and months of anxious watching, study, and labor are requisite before commercial success or failure is certainly reached. So that's the perspiration? None of my inventions came by accident. They came by work. Opportunities missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls. It looks like work. And believe me, it wasn't just my work. I started with a dozen muckers. And by the time I was in my West Orange labs, I had thousands of people working to get things right. It usually takes five to seven years to perfect a thing. And some things I've been working on for 25 years. And some of them are still unsolved. So does that mean you've failed in some of your work? I've not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. <laughs> so which invention was your favorite? Well, I like the phonograph best because I love music. And it's brought so much joy to millions of homes all over this country. Indeed, all over the world. Yes, Thomas, that may have been your favorite, but you never patented your best invention, the Industrial Research Laboratory. You turned inventions into a business, and you know that if I know anything, I know business. So sorry about that, Tesla mess. I, I know you never forgave me, but I feel bound in honor when I reorganize a property to protect it. But I did see the value of your approach, so Mr. Steinmetz, has to start General Electric Research Lab and rely more on science than trial and error, he had my full support. So did it work? Why, in only a few short years, they invented the mercury rectifier, the world's largest steam turbine, and of course, the tungsten light bulb filament that you still use after a hundred years. Well, wasn't it costly to keep an R&D organization going? My good man, if you have to ask how much it costs, you can't afford it. <laughs> Mr. Morgan's correct. Research is expensive, but you need to invest in turning science into future products or your competition will pass you by. I wasn't a scientist or an inventor, but I did have a vision for what technology could do. And I have learned to have more faith in the scientist than he does in it himself. When I retired from RCA, it was a $3 billion business, and we created broadcast radio, television, and color television as industries, not just inventions. So when you started these projects, did you know how long they would take and what it would cost? Oh, hey. When we started developing television in the RCA labs in 1920, Doctors Walken told me it would cost $100,000. Turned out it took over a decade and $50 million. That's three quarter of a billion dollars in your time, but it was worth every penny. As I said in the 1939 World's Fair, I was humbled to give birth to a new art so important in its implication that it would affect all society. Weren't you accountable to upper management and corporate boards for all of those expenditures? Well, naturally, but I always had my eye on new markets. Back in 1915, when I was a young man working for the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Company, I wrote a memo to management that everyone should own a radio music box. They said it had no imaginable commercial value. Who would pay for a message that is sent to nobody in particular? I didn't give up my idea when RCA was formed a few years later and I joined as a general manager. They had just acquired Victor Records and with it a big investment in their Camden manufacturing plant and recording studios. I convinced them that radio could promote new records and spread the RCA brand 
and three years after our first broadcast, we had radio sales of over $80 million. So it sounds like you were a systems thinker. We built an entire industry from recording studios all the way to broadcast antennas and everything in between. Well, Mr. Sarnoff, I'm sorry to say your people were slow to adopt the solid state revolution that I started. Dr. Shockley, welcome to the conversation. Tell us more about how you came to this discovery. Well, I came to Bell Laboratories in 1936 after finishing my doctorate at MIT. I chose to work there because the objective of producing useful devices has strongly influenced the choice of the research projects which I've been associated. When I arrived, Director Melvin Kelly had already been challenged to find a more reliable solution to vacuum tubes for the National Telephone Switching Enterprise. He had a notion that we should develop solid-state physics, and he was hiring experts like me to see what we could produce. In 1939, I wrote in my lab book that an amplifier using semiconductors rather than vacuum is in principle possible. The history of the creation of the transistor reveals that the foundations of the transistor electronics were created by making errors and following hunches that failed to give what was expected. So there were many researchers working on this in their own laboratories? We had many scientists pursuing their own ideas, but the Murray Hill Lab was designed to encourage collaboration. The lab doors were all windowed, and the long corridors all led to the lunchroom to encourage us to be inquisitive about our colleagues' work and to look for partners. So how did that help you? Well, my strength was in the theory. Had I not partnered with Walter Bratton and John Bardeen, we never would have done the experiments to prove my theory and led to the fabrication of the first working transistor. So even Nobel laureates need teams? Well, of course. When I left Bell to return home to Palo Alto, the first thing I did was hire bright PhD students from Stanford. Many of them went on to form their own companies. You may have heard of Fairchild or uh, and Moore and Noyce formed a little company called Intel. So I think it's fair to say that I brought the silicon to Silicon Valley. And I'm glad you did. Rawaz and I would never have been into computers, and Markle wouldn't have made enough money at Fairchild and Intel to get Apple out of my parents' garage. So you created products that disrupted industries, from PCs to cell phones. Some call you a modern Edison. What do you think of that comparison? Well, that's high praise. I, I don't know. But, you know, Edison said he was a sponge more than an inventor. And I guess that would describe me, too. When a good idea comes, you know, part of my job is to move it around, just to see what different people think, get people talking about it, argue with people about it, get ideas moving. You know, innovation comes from people meeting up in the hallways or calling each other at 1030 at night with a new idea or because they realize something that shoots holes in the way we've been thinking about a problem. Part of what made the Macintosh great was that the people working on it were musicians and poets and artists and zoologists and historians who also happen to be the best computer scientists in the world. I think they're the real inventors. And that's why Apple has over 10,000 patents. So innovation's important. America's in a tough spot now, I think. I think we've forgotten the basics. We were so prosperous for so long that we took too many things for granted. We forgot how much work it takes to build and sustain the things that were supporting our prosperity. We're being outplanned, we're being outstrategized, and we're being outmanufactured. I know a lot of companies have chosen to downsize to compete, and I guess maybe that was all right for them. But for Apple, the cure is not cost cutting. The cure for Apple is to innovate. I believe that if we put great products in front of customers, they'll continue to open their wallets. So can't mature companies de-emphasize innovation and focus on efficiency? Watch the movie. See how that turned out for Scully. <laughs> Apple's acquired over 100 companies, including Siri. Is that a new strategy? Tech is moving too fast for one company to invent everything. I look for companies that have great ideas and great leaders. I'm particularly fond of the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers. The connection to the TED Times server has been lost. Shall I try again? No, that's okay. I think we've, we've gotten the message here. Because if you look back now at the great inventors spanning a century, there are certain common elements in their approach, and it doesn't matter whether they were in the era of Bell and Edison or contemporaries 
like uh, the, the world of Apple. First of all, they're always connected to the marketplace. Uh, they're being driven by solving practical problems, but they're not asking the market to tell them the answer. Uh, there's a quote which may or may not have come from Henry Ford that was, if I were to ask people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. So the people may not be able to tell you the answer, but they can tell you the problem. And these people had the genius to tap into that. And then the freedom, uh, the environment in which they could use their imagination to conceive new ideas, that's very much a lonely sport. But to make those ideas turn into something, it would clearly takes teams. And it takes people with diverse backgrounds, it takes uh, diverse skill sets in all of those, from Edison's muckers to Stephen Jobs' cohorts. They all had lots of people who could enrich the idea and help it grow. And it's never a straight line to success. They don't get it right the first time, which makes these things very frustrating to the modern corporate model because you can't put it in a spreadsheet. You have to have some faith, like, like uh, Sarnoff did, that the people are going to get to the right answer. It involves prototyping, which is expensive. It involves uh, what Edison said, invention requires a good pile of junk. You need to be able to get things out there, see how they work, and rework them. And that means it takes patient capital, and none of those things seem to fit in today's business model. So what can we do about it? We think we can take some inspiration from the world of natural ecosystems and then build idea ecosystems. Right? So just like the natural world has a, a pecking order, a food chain that, group, that uh, maintains a certain balance in life, yet has common things like the watering hole that sustains everyone, we think we can build innovation ecosystems in which our organization is the water. We create common infrastructure, things that inventors need, and we do it in a sector-specific way from clean room manufacturing for the next generation of biologics to drive the pharmaceutical industry to lighting up Newark as a test bed for the Internet of Things or running the state's healthcare information exchange and bringing new technologies in to make healthcare faster, cheaper, better. And on top of those industry sector-specific attributes, common programs in which we can create teaming across organizations in which we can help small businesses grow and mature, but also connect them with the big guys. So that's a benefit for the small companies. They can plug into resources they could never imagine to have on their own. For large companies, they have access now to the innovation, the, the, the risk that's being borne by small companies. They can provide access to market problems and to, and to the, the drivers that are the practical constraints that sometimes have to take those harebrained ideas and make them take a course correction. And it's a place where the investment community can find the up-and-coming stars, can find the partnerships that need nurturing and will provide a return on investment, and also a place where they can bring their portfolio of investments. But there's more to this picture because it's also a place where our universities, in some cases they have IP, and that really fits then into the small company and startup, but it's opportunities for students to engage in co-op and inter positions. It's ways for universities to provide specialized equipment into the mix, to provide test and evaluation capabilities, business strategies and consulting, and it's a way in which government can leverage its investments in the private sector in a more effective way. Those are the ecosystems that we're trying to build. Love to have the opportunity to explore that more with you. But what that means then when we say a new model of industrial innovation, it means we're finding ways to cluster to collaborate and collaborate to compete. Thank you all.